All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, this call is being recorded. We do thank you for joining us. This is a, a webinar session between Wheelhouse IT and uh, SonicWall, who is our cybersecurity experts. Um, on the line, you have Shamari Smith, who works for SonicWall. Um, this is really just kind of an, an overview of, of how to protect your, your business and how Wheelhouse IT is sort of here in the background to help work alongside SonicWall. So without further ado, I am going to throw this over to Shamari and let you guys do your thing. Thank you very much for the introduction, Rory. I really appreciate it. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shamari Smith. I am the Territory Account Manager for Sonical, covering our customer base in Florida. And this is meant to be a very brief overview of an area of increasing importance for a lot of organizations today. And that is uh, things to think about when it comes to the world of software as a service. Uh, a lot of folks, most organizations today, are either migrating some applications that they're utilizing for business functionality, process improvement, uh, customer interaction, you name it, uh, to the cloud, away from things that are on-prem. So this is going to talk a little bit about that evolution and also some things to think about when how to properly protect your employees, your intellectual property, business intelligence moving forward as threats evolve, the threat landscape evolves. So where were we prior to this large proliferation of software as a service application? It's kind of siloed. The, the IT space as a whole kind of does these pendulum swings. And if you recall back in the 70s and 80s, a lot of stuff was actually centralized in these really big honking servers called mainframes, right? So back in the 70s and 80s, everything was centralized outside of the business. You had to remotely access some things. And then you started pushing everything to the cloud. So you had Exchange servers, you had SharePoint, you had Drive, you had file servers. All that stuff was kept within the confines of your walled garden. Remote, app and remote employees would always have to dial in by ways like VPN to access important information protected behind that wall. But the data resided with you. You had to buy a lot of hard drives, you had to buy a lot of storage um, and applications to either spin up on dedicated servers or as the virtualization increased in virtual environments. That allowed you to build some economies of scale. The next kind of swing is all that compute was pushing towards the outside, or the edge. So companies would say, okay, run this instance of Microsoft in your environment, as opposed to a big centralized mainframe. We're, we're at the point where the pendulum is swinging back towards the cloud. A lot of that is because connectivity has increased. So the cost of bandwidth has decreased precipitously over the last decade. You're probably experiencing significant upticks in allotted bandwidth for your organization as a result of just the price of and parity or, or, or proliferation of bandwidth becoming ubiquitous across a large part of the US as well as the world. And with that, compute has also increased uh, exponentially. So being able to do the power of the work can be now done offshore. Microsoft Office 365, G Suite, and thousands of other cloud applications have now provided access to Webinar. your business function, access to your business function from anywhere in the world giving you a little bit more business agility and also hopefully driving down total cost of use for those business functions, whether it be email, whether it be collaboration applications like Microsoft Teams or Slack, whether it be um, ERP applications, CRM applications like Salesforce, a lot of the functionality that you used to have to power on your own in-house is now available to you from anywhere you connect to the internet. All you really need is an internet connection. But as a result of that, threat vectors and the threat landscape has kind of changed. What you used to have full-blown control over is now sometimes at the mercy of the cloud provider. 
and you might lose some visibility along the way. And that's something to really, really consider when talking about how to properly protect your organization. We'll go to the next slide. So, something that's really important to remember when utilizing software as a service solution, and this isn't clearly stated or widely known, is that you are still responsible for the protection and safeguarding of your data, even when it's hosted in the cloud. The SaaS providers, Microsoft, Salesforce, Dropbox, and more, are actually responsible for the stability and integrity of their platform, as well as the features and functionality that your business needs to operate or improve efficiencies. This delineation is usually outlined deep in the EULA, which I know every one of you has read for every application you signed up for, from the pro provider. But how many times can you honestly say you've gone through one of those things with a fine tooth comb? Deep within those EULAs are statements that say Microsoft, Google, Dropbox, ShareFile, and all these other SaaS app providers are only responsible for the gray part. I'm sorry, the, the, the green part of the slide that you're looking at right now. The stability of the platform, the, the security of the platform itself, the integration of features and functionality as that platform evolves. But your data and compliance associated with the data that you upload to that platform and you utilize within that platform is actually your responsibility. So unauthorized sharing, things to think about, malware, if it somehow infects uh, a file within your SaaS application or the SaaS, how do you protect against it? How do you see it? Protecting against sensitive file uploads, audits and compliance. A lot of that actually resides on you, the customer. So what are the threat vectors that are commonly applicable to SaaS applications today? Number one in blue, email and malicious URLs. Email is something that we still use in the vast majority of organizations uh, on a very regular basis as a form of communication, a form of tracking, a form of sharing documentation with not only internally with employees, but also externally with ecosystem partners, with customers, with vendors that you deal with upstream. And along with that, email attachments in orange. About, I think, 70, low 70s percentile were in terms of threats or associated with documents that are attached to email or emails themselves. Those types of compromises are the most common compromises just because of the ubiquity and frequency of use of email as a communication platform. But also things like compromised accounts. SAS data storage itself, the data that's at rest and not actually going in or out of your environment or the SAS provider's environment. And finally, and the hardest one potentially, is people, your employees. Not everybody has the same level of understanding uh, best practices when it comes to cybersecurity, uh, trust, and, and having a, how do you say, uh, careful attention to the credibility of whom they are communicating with on a regular basis, where the information they're receiving is coming from, and whether it is actually credible, valid in nature, and not harmful. So we'll, we'll touch a little bit on each one of those threat vectors and things to think about along the way. So, phishing. Over the years, there was an explosion, over the last 15 to 20 years, there was an explosion of phishing types of email, which are solicitations that come in and try to either trick a user, right, into giving intellectual property, compromising account information, or something along those lines of compromising a business in some way, shape, or form. That's evolved. And Phishing has gone into sphere phishing or targeted phishing, as well as whale phishing. Now, the delineation between those three 
is as follows. Regular fishing is more spray and pray. I am the prince of Zamunda. If anybody is uh, familiar with the movie Coming to America, it's one of my favorites. And I'm reaching out to you, um, my trusted colleague, because I have come across a long buried estate with $20 million in it. And I'd like to establish bona fides with you. And I will entrust 10% of this state for you helping to facilitate the transaction. So all you need to do is send $1,000 to me. And I know we'll have an established modicum of trust. And you'll be entitled to a million dollars. Right? Most people don't fall for that anymore. And most email providers now have the ability to detect those types of attacks. Now we move on to things like spear phishing, utilizing information most of the time publicly available to you or anyone to increase the level of credibility. So what does that mean? It might mean it's coming from someone you know or utilizing descriptors that only people you regularly interact with would know about you. You get an email from someone in the accounting firm or, or the accounting firm you do business with. You get an email with an attachment from someone within your finance department. You get an email that says, hey, I'm an outside vendor. I know you work for this organization. I know where you work. I know what you were doing last week because perhaps that information was publicly available on a source like LinkedIn or another social media account. Okay. This person has a little bit of a semblance of an idea of my daily going on. They kind of know what I've been doing, what I've been up to. That establishes some credibility, right? It's not coming from a far off country or some phishing attempt that immediately looks suspicious to the normal average employee. Take that one step further to whale phishing. Whale phishing means the email, the compromised email or compromised attachment might be coming from someone in a position of power, the president or CEO of a contractor we work with or a customer we work with, or even the CEO of our own company sends an email out to the administrative team or the executive team saying, I need everybody to review this Excel file, go over our quarterly numbers because we need to make a market update at the end of the year different types of phishing, leveraging the power of what you know, who you are to different levels, and also establishing credibility because it might be coming from a source that you immediately deem credible. Some organizations will do regular testing on a monthly, quarterly, annual basis to see how trusting their users are of what could potentially be suspicious emails. They'll do internal email audits and they'll send out a malicious email, but it might come from a source the user knows. Do they fall for it and click the link? Do they fall for it and open detachment? That allows you to kind of self-check the awareness and skepticism of your employees. However, this method is a still a very common way and it does get through the spam filters of most of the SaaS applications you utilize when it comes to email, things like Microsoft, to a, a degree where you're still at your business is still at risk. So how do you protect against that? The next one, business email compromise. Impersonation of vendors with things like invoice records or payroll or some other outside um, or sometimes internal resource that you deal with in a traditional business function to operate day to day. Compromised email credentials. And this could come from internal, it could come from high up, it could come from an ecosystem partner or vendor or customer. And these usually show up in the left, on the bottom left, in those type of variations. Payroll, transfer fund requests, vendor has been has email compromised, W2 requests, things along those lines. And these are all traditional normal ways of interacting with outside parties 
So because you do it so commonly, it might be harder to spot when a bad actor with malicious intent comes in, compromises that outside vendor, and then figures out a way to infiltrate, infiltrate your network by tricking an unsuspecting employee. And you can see from last year to this summer, there was a 100% increase in exposed losses. So this is fast becoming a stronger threat vector to consider when going about protecting your SaaS environment and protecting your employees as well as your intellectual property. The third, account takeover. So credentials are the crown jewels. Getting super user access, admin access, high level access to accounts associated with your SaaS environment. If you are the administrator or someone you know might be the administrator of your SaaS environment, your credentials and logins are obviously a lot more valuable to bad actors than Peggy in accounting. I apologize if there's a Peggy on the call. I sometimes like to pick on her. But bad actors can approach these in a couple of different ways to infiltrate an environment surreptitiously without necessarily leaving a, a pretty large trail in their wake and could go undetected for longer periods of time, siphoning data, cloning data, or freezing data in the, in the, in the form of uh, ransomware and encrypting your intellectual property to increase the level of hurt to your organization. How do they do that? Things like brute force attacks on weak passwords. Bad actors will comb the web and we hear about it on an almost weekly basis now. So-and-so's company got, a comp got compromised. Whether it be ransomware or some sort of malware infection, we're seeing this at an accelerated rate these days more than ever before. And that's happening across all industries. Schools, municipalities, and local governments, healthcare providers. I think it was just either this week or last week that the biggest, one of the biggest healthcare providers in the state of New Jersey, Meridian, got hit by a malware ransomware attack. The state of Texas, uh, a couple months back, had 23 different um, local governments affected by ransomware. Even within the state of Florida, we've had a number of municipalities, state local governments that have been affected by ransomware style attacks, malware attacks and being able to compromise an organization by utilizing compromised credentials and passwords is one of the fastest growing ways and easiest ways for these bad actors to get in. The, 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 the hygiene that's so important to remember is are things like never utilizing the same password for two different services. And people usually common denominator default to simplicity. What's the easiest way to have uh, credentials for these 50 different sites that I do business with or I receive services from? I'm gonna kinda just use the same password or I'll use a variation of the same password for 10 of them, maybe the same password variation for another 15. It's easier for me to remember, it's simpler, it'll be all right. But so many of these services are getting um, compromised now that the bad actors have a large treasure trove of usernames, emails, and password combinations that they can essentially just continue to test the fence like the, like the Velociraptor in Jurassic Park, looking for weaknesses. Does this match? No. Does this combination? No. Match? No. And they'll do this thousands, hundreds of thousands of times per minute until they figure out a way in. Also making sure you enforce two-factor authentication or some sort of multi-factor authentication approach is a conversation that should be had within your organization for any service that makes it available to you. What does that mean? Two-factor authentication, if you haven't heard that term before, it's what you know and what you have. 
So two different sources are needed for proper authentication to a service. And more, more and more businesses are starting to provide that option, but it's something that should be demanded or even required as opposed to just optional. If you ask me or you ask the good folks at Wheelhouse IT. Two-factor two authentication at least says if Sue in finance had her password credentials from a social media account compromised because that company got compromised and the bad actors get her password username combo and they try it on your organization for one of your SaaS apps and it's successful, it will still prompt for either a rolling encryption key on Susan's laptop or her phone or her tablet or something more rudimentary like a text message saying, hey, you're logging in, is it you? One for yes, two for no. Or here's a six digit code to put in as a next step to actually authenticate yourself and say, it's you that's actually logging in. Only 10%, one other key point, only 10% of Gmail users, both business as well as personal, use two-factor authentication in all of 2018, just to put things in perspective. Fourth, data compliance and protection. In our traditional corporate environments, we have tighter control on preventing data from leaving, protecting files and storage from malware and sensitive data loss are CASB characteristics, cloud application security broker characteristics. When you have device sync on, and most people have that on by default for convenience sake, for speed of doing business between your laptop, your phone, your tablet, your coworkers' devices, the central server, um, both in the cloud or on-prem, it, it might allow malware to spread at a very rapid pace. You have to make sure that for data compliance reasons, for auditing reasons, for visibility into what's going on into your network, you have these compliance standards in place. You have a, a rock solid level of data protection in place. And it also is dependent on your, maybe the vertical that your organization operates in. Maybe you're a healthcare provider. You have to talk about HIPAA compliance. And I just realized there's an extra P in there and it's missing an A, so forgive me. For PCI compliance, if you are dealing in retail and you're accepting things like secure payments for, from credit cards, do you know how things are operating in your cloud SaaS environment to maintain regulatory compliance with those standards? Are you able to generate easy to view and, uh, reports and self audit on a regular basis? Or are you entrusting that level of protection to the SaaS provider? How are you protecting your data when it comes to these things? And you have to protect across all different threat vectors, malware, ransomware, where is sensitive data stored? How is it stored? Do you have visibility as an administrator to that data? Who can, having the ability to control and who shares that data internally and externally to your organization? And exfiltration. When data leaves, where does it go? Do you know and can you track that exfiltration? And in 2018, as you see in the bottom right, over 50%, over half, of cyber attack victims were small businesses. So they're not always going after the white whale um, in terms of the types of organizations who might have the wherewithal and the deep pockets to spend deeply on cybersecurity protections and having a layered approach to cybersecurity. They might be going after the smaller organizations that don't necessarily have those pockets or bankroll to you know, buy the big honking chassis of solutions when it comes to properly protecting their environment. They might be leveraging SaaS apps at an even higher rate because of the total cost of ownership efficiencies those SaaS apps might provide. 
And the final point, people. As I was saying before, it's very common for folks to reutilize passwords across not only professional accounts, but their personal accounts. And that creates a lot of problems when you're trying to protect the integrity and intellectual property in your environment. Not only that, awareness is a continual problem as the threat landscape evolves and iterates at such a rapid pace. How are you proactively training your employees, educating your employees, and motivating them to actually follow the guidelines you set forth, enforcing it on the back end? Accidental or intentional, the threat's real. People will utilize the same credentials over and over again. They might, because of convenience or comfort level, bring in an application that they like to use in their own personal environment. For example, uh, one very common one are storage accounts, Dropbox or Box or OneDrive. They might have a personal Microsoft 365 account and they have that linked up to all their devices in their home network. So when they travel, they can access all their personal files wherever they go. And you come in and you say, well, we're using this standard for storage of uh, business documentation. And they'll say, yeah, but it's just one more thing I have to have on my phone, or I have to remember this multi-step process to log in every time, or it breaks the connection after X amount of hours. It's just kind of inconvenient. I'm going to take those important business files and put them in my personal Dropbox, just so it allows me to do my work easier. How do you know they're doing that? Having that kind of visibility into your environment is of paramount importance. Not only the sanctioned SaaS applications being used and authorized by your IT environment and your leadership, but the shadow IT aspect. What else is running on your network that is unsanctioned, that's not allowed? And how do you either block it or educate your employees to stop utilizing it in an improper way. So, weakest link, unfortunately, continues to be people across all those threat vectors. So, in summary, there's a lot to think about when it comes to software as a service, utilizing software as a service in your environment in a meaningful way, and how to proactively, as opposed to reactively, protect against it. A lot of these organizations, larger organizations, will actually even take out insurance policies for things like ransomware. And while insurance is that thing that we love to hate, but feel the need that we need to pay for, maybe it's better to be more proactive in your approach to staying ahead of the bad actors, protecting your environment, educating your users, than it is to sit back, have one fence around your organization, proverbial fence around your organization, as opposed to having a fence, a moat, bars on the windows, and uh, attack dogs sitting on the back porch. A layered defense, a layered approach to defense and protection is the recommended path. Not enough just to leverage what the SaaS application or provider is giving you in terms of quoted protections. Take this control into your own hands and have the visibility, the, the actionable intelligence to immediately remediate if and when that breach does occur. Because bad actors are always trying different ways. You might have all your security at the front door and the back door of your house. But are you watching every window, a crack in the roof, uh, uh, a gap in the, the settlement on the side of the house? Because they're not necessarily going to throw everything at your front door. They're going to try every angle. So having that defense and depth strategy is of paramount, important, perform, uh, paramount importance. And it's always something to think about as your business evolves and as you continue to leverage these SaaS apps. Um, today, tomorrow, and beyond. So I hope that was educational. I hope it was not too technical. This was meant to be 
uh, a light and interesting affair. And please direct your follow-up questions, um, inquiries about uh, what you have today, what you're doing today, um, and how you can better protect yourselves today and tomorrow to the good folks at Wheelhouse IT. And they take a very consultative approach to helping you be prepared for the unknown. I really appreciate you taking out the time and your lunch hour today to, to, to join us. And if you have any questions, uh, direct it to Rory and his uh, good associates at Wheelhouse, and I'm there to support on the back end. Thank you. Shamari, I do thank you for your time and you brought up a lot of good points and a lot of it is, is what we've been preaching uh, over the last couple of years is that what you have may not be enough and you gotta look a little bit deeper, including training and, and down to the people. Um, again, like Shamari said, if you guys have any questions, comments, or concerns, if you're a current client, because I know we have a good mix of current clients and, and non-clients on this webinar today, if you're a current client, you have questions, feel free to reach out to your account manager and, and he or she will walk through your options. If you're not a current client and you want to figure out, hey, how can I protect my business and is what my, my I, either internal IT department doing enough or is what um, my external IT department is doing enough or do you not have an IT department at all and you just are curious what should you be doing, uh, feel free to reach out to us and, and an easy way to do that is sales at wheelhouseit.com. Um, just shoot us an email that way or pick up the phone and give us a call and we're more than happy to help out. Uh, we have a, a lot of knowledge in the background and several um, security and compliance experts on the back end and, and a lot of resources that we can pump your way and make sure that we set you guys up for success. Um, before everybody goes, I, I want to open up the floor for questions, comments, or concerns. Everybody has the ability to unmute themselves if you have a question or you can simply chat into the chat window and then Shamari or I can, can take over. Um, if not, we do thank you for your time and we appreciate that you, you've afforded us your time in, in this afternoon. Um, so yeah, the Merry floor, Christmas the, and happy holidays too. <laughs> yeah. So the floor is open if anybody has any questions, comments, or concerns. Yeah, I, I have a question. I really enjoyed this. Thank you very much. And I've been guilty in the past of doing all sorts of stupid things in hindsight, like um, writing my passwords down on a piece of paper putting it in a file mm -hmm. so I can save them and then like emailing them in an attachment. And I'm like, holy crap, if someone tacked into my email, there's a history there and they got all my passwords, right? So what do you, and so now like on my smartphone, for instance, I got some password where I could touch it and then the passwords yep. magically in my cell phone, right? So, and that seems to work pretty well. So what do you recommend people do to save their passwords but not make them where there where someone can get into it is there a agreed upon process for that these days should, should Rory, I, do you want me to answer that yeah you can you can answer it and then i'll tag on if, if you didn't hit, hit the point that yeah, i was going to make sure so one uh thank you i'm glad you found it uh entertaining the presentation entertaining uh you're one you're taking the right step now i am a staunch advocate both uh at my, at my house uh, I had to nag my wife for several months to get on the password manager train, but now I have my whole family and, and friends, most of my friends utilizing it. Uh, password managers are probably the simplest answer to the question that you've asked. Um, they consolidate. I mean, their whole business is providing uh, the highest levels of encryption and security for randomizing and protecting um, and isolating your passwords and then providing those credentials in a secure fashion for autofilling. So like you with one password, I have used historically, I've used a, a software called LastPass. There are other solutions out there. Some of them are more geared towards business than they are towards traditional consumer, but I would recommend exploring and having that conversation with Warriors and his team because they might have uh, a, a short list or a recommendation in that, in that space it's important to definitely leverage those solutions because they make the process of having randomized unique passwords for each login or each service simple, right? The, 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 the thing that we run into on a regular basis is simplicity and ease of use versus security. Uh, it's always historically been if it's really hard and there's a lot of friction, users aren't going to do it, especially those that aren't more technically inclined, even though it might benefit them, right? It's the same thing as 
you're driving a car into a bad part of the, the city, a bad neighborhood, and your car is a nice car, but you know, you just lock the doors and think, well, that's enough. It's the easiest thing to do. I do it everywhere I go. But then you walk next to a car that's in front of yours, and that car has a club on the car. So we, we all remember those. My dad <laughs> still keeps one in the trunk of his car religiously, right? If a, re- if a bad actor really wanted to get in that car, they still could. They could bring the right tools. It might cause some noise. It might take them twice as long to break into that car and steal it as it would to be your car. But it's a deterrent. It's an extra level of defense. Utilizing a password manager tries to remove some of that friction. And that means they are signing up for a new service or a SaaS app, and they say, you know, create your credentials the first time. They go into their password manager, they add the site, they press the plus sign or the add, the add button, and then it pre populates the nice long randomized character string that they will never remember or never need to remember moving forward. And that can integrate in the browser, that can integrate in your smartphone, your desktop, all your devices. They're meant to be relatively frictionless and easy to use. So that's definitely something I would encourage everyone, if they're not doing today, to strongly consider. Set up the first time, bit of a pain, because you got to go through all your online accounts and change up your passwords if you've been using the same thing or a variation of the same thing historically. But once it's set up, it's very simple to utilize and very simple to update and change. They'll actually do it. Some of them will actually do it for you. You'll, you can go to change password on a service, a website you might log into, like a forum or a shopping website like Amazon, you click change password, and LastPass will actually pop up and say, hey, here's a new password for you. Click fill to fill it in. And it will update and save the changes and populate it across all your devices securely. I can't speak to one specifically meant for business, but that in combination with two-factor authentication um, services like uh, Duo or Google and Microsoft Authenticator um, add that additional layer of protection without adding too much friction for users to be willing to adopt it. Great, thank that you very much. Questions. Yeah, thank you very much. I don't know how to even go after that. So you, you kind of covered it all there. <laughs> Use awesome. a password manager. <laughs> yeah. I swear to you, every week, another service that most people use will get some sort, will have some sort of data leak, get compromised in some fashion. And the dark web, which is that quote unquote insidious underbelly, of the internet that most people don't really know about, but they've heard the term before on a news broadcast, is a repository for all this stuff. And it never actually goes away. So all the all that data that's being collected from the healthcare provider that got compromised last month to Target that got compromised in 2016 to uh, Experian um, that got compromised and things like social security numbers are floating out there for half of the US. All that stuff never actually goes away. It All it does is increase the amount of things or identifiable items that bad actors might know about you. And then you're also posting things on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, about what you do, what you like, what you buy, where you go, they can combine all that information together to give a relatively good footprint of who you are and what your interests and preferences are. And that might inform how they go about trying to compromise credentials for the place you work. So it's important to remember that one, posting a lot of stuff to social media is not necessarily a good thing. And two, obfuscating Passwords not utilizing the same password everywhere you go is of critical importance in this day and age. Awesome. Use a password manager. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions? All right, it does not appear so. So at that time, we're going to call this a, a, a close to our webinar. We do, again, appreciate everybody for joining us. Shamari and Sonicwal, thank you for, for being yeah, uh, valued partners. Um, 
we look forward to, to working with each and every one of you and continuing our partnership. And again, this webinar will be on our website for, for future review if you'd like to watch it again. Yeah. And then we'll have more coming out in 2020. So we do thank you for your time and appreciate everybody for, for joining us this afternoon. Have a great day. Thank, have a great thank day. you. Happy holidays.